Good afternoon. Can I remind members uh, of the COVID-related uh, measures and that face coverings should be worn while moving around the Chamber and the wider Holyrood campus? The next item of business is portfolio questions, and portfolio is constitution, external affairs and culture. I'd also remind members that questions five and six are grouped together, uh, and I'll uh, take supplementaries after both questions have been answered, and as ever, if any member wishes to ask a supplementary on any of the questions, I would ask them to press the request to speak buttons or place an R in the chat function during the relevant questions. Uh, the usual plea for brevity in both questions and answers to allow us to get uh, through as many as possible, and I call question number one, Russell Finlay. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how many of its staff members are working in the prospectus for another independence referendum. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, the work to prepare an independence prospectus has been coordinated by the Constitutional Futures Division within the Scottish Government's Constitution and Cabinet Directorate. This division is currently comprised of one senior civil servant and 14 other officials. The work will draw on other officials across a range of portfolios who will contribute to varying extents as part of their wider responsibilities in supporting the Scottish Government. Russell Finlay. Thank you. Now, people across Scotland will be dismayed to discover that this SNP Government is diverting yet more precious staff and resources towards another referendum. The SNP's own programme for Government says work in this would only take place if the Covid crisis is over. Can the Cabinet Secretary then explain why his government is ignoring their own programme and squandering money on this obsession which the people of Scotland do not want. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, may I begin by commending the member for the implicit recognition in his original question that there will be an independence uh, referendum. I think that's very welcome. We obviously differed on this issue in the Scottish Parliament uh, election last year, but as Democrats, we all hopefully recognise that the parties committed to there being a referendum won the election and the parties that opposed the referendum, such as his, lost the election. Uh, we're now getting on with uh, delivering on the policy of the government, including a prospectus ahead of the uh, independence referendum, and I look forward to further announcements on that in the future. A couple of brief supplementaries. First, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise us how many staff are currently working in government on Brexit related matters for a policy Scotland did not vote for compared to an independence referendum which Scotland did vote for? And does he agree that the £120 million the UK Tory government squandered on the ludicrous festival of Brexit earlier this month? was a complete waste of public money. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding. Uh, also, the Constitutional Futures Division, who are working on the prospectus, is comprised, as I have already mentioned, of one senior civil servant and 14 other officials. The far-reaching consequences of Brexit has meant that almost all parts of the Scottish Government have had or continue to have officials dedicated to assessing and responding to the UK's exit from the European Union. Brexit has seen UK goods exports fall by 14 per cent in the three months to January, all while the global average continued to rise over the same period. The opportunities of independence stand in stark contrast to the economic damage posed by Brexit, and it must be up to the people of Scotland to decide their future. I'm Willie Rennie. A war in Ukraine, a pandemic raging with its highest infection rates in the whole of the United Kingdom, enormous hospital waiting times, people desperate for care home packages, and a ferries construction scandal, yet the Minister carries on regardless. If even independent supporters do not think there should be an independent referendum now, why is he carrying on regardless? Cabinet Secretary. One of the, the things that I always thought democracy and Democrats stood for, in, including in the name, of the, the name of the Members' Party, Liberal Democrats, was to recognise that when one stood in an election, on a manifesto opposing something and lost, lost, and the party that won the election did so on a, on a, a manifesto to deliver a referendum, that even a Liberal Democrat would recognise the democratic result of the election result, would commend us to get on with our policy platform rather than, rather than jeering from the sidelines in opposition, effectively, to the democratic election result of last year. Question number two, Neil Bibby. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what response it has received to the External Affairs Secretary's letter to the Russian Ambassador on the 26th of February. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> I wrote to the Russian Ambassador on the 26th of February uh, condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine in the strongest possible terms. 
laying out the Scottish Government's position that Russia's illegal aggression against Ukraine had no conceivable justification. I have not received a response from the Russian ambassador. I will continue to condemn Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine and offer my unqualified support for Ukrainian sovereignty, for its independence and for its territorial integrity. Neil Bibby. I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The solidarity people have shown with Ukraine is undiminished after more than a month of fighting. So too is the resolve of the international community to isolate instruments of the Russian state. To reinforce the sentiments he expressed to the Russian Embassy, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that more should be done here in Scotland to divest public money from sanctioned hit financial institutions like Sharebank? And will the, Scot the Scottish Government have encouraged uh, companies trading with Russia to take economic action will they support our public sector pension funds and other Scottish instit institutions to do so too? Cabinet Secretary. So the short answer is yes uh, to the points that Neil Bibby uh, raises, but I think in addition it is important for us uh, to stress that this country stands together with all of those in the international community who oppose this illegal war, whether they are in Russia, Belarus, here in Scotland or elsewhere in the world. I understand that Police Scotland have engaged directly with both Ukrainian and Russian communities to provide reassurance and to encourage them to report any concerns so Police Scotland can work with communities to address these, and that University of Scotland have confirmed that institutions are reaching out to both Ukrainian and Russian students with offers of support. But is there more that we can be doing to identify whether there is any way of hitting the Putin regime and those in the Russian economy who support him? The answer to that is yes. If he has any further suggestions, I would be re really pleased to hear those, because I think there is consensus right across Parliament that we should be doing everything that we can do uh, to oppose the aggression of the Russian Federation against the uh, people of Ukraine. I supplementary, Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary's letter stated our quarrel is not with the people of Russia nor the Russian community who live and work in Scotland, but with President Putin's regime and its deplorable actions. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can give us any further reassurance or work that is being done to provide the Russians and Belarusians who oppose authoritarianism in their homelands but who may be at risk of unfair treatment here in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> this is exactly the point that I was making uh, a moment ago, is that uh, through our interaction with the likes of the Ukrainian consulate in Scotland, but also with the Ukrainian community organisations, but also sending out a, mes a message to people living in Scotland who are of Belarusian heritage or of Russian heritage, our quarrel is not with those who stand with all of the rest of us in opposition to the aggression of the uh, of the Putin uh, regime. It is not their fault, and we need to do everything that we can. I have already made mention of the efforts that have been undertaken by Police Scotland to make sure that community uh, relations are maintained, but that at the same time we are unequivocal uh, about our opposition to the naked aggression against Ukraine, uh, that we will do everything that we can to help Ukrainians who are in Scotland, but also those who seek refuge and would wish to come here. Um, uh, to get out of harm's way from the aggression that has been wrought on their country. Question number three, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on its global affairs uh, framework. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> work on the global affairs framework is continuing, and the framework will be published in due course. Annabel Ewing. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for his uh, brief answer and look forward in due course to the publication of the framework. But I wonder if, at this moment in time, he is able to update us on the work of the Scottish Council on Global Affairs, set up last autumn, I believe, and also if he could take this opportunity to report on the work being undertaken to expand the fantastic resource of the Scottish Diaspora Network across the world. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Council on Global Affairs will be Scotland's first international relations institute, providing a hub for collaborative policy relevant research and a home for informed non partisan debate on all areas of global affairs. I am pleased that the universities of Glasgow, of Edinburgh and St Andrews will be formally launching the institute at the end of April. Across the Scottish Government, we have a wide range of activity to engage with our diaspora groups and those with a connection with or affinity to Scotland. Our external network of international offices will work directly with our diaspora communities in key locations around the world, and two new overseas offices, those are in Copenhagen and Warsaw, will expand this network further. We are also uh, currently undertaking research to advise and inform our future approach to diaspora engagement to expand our international um, impact. 
Brief supplementary, Sarah Boyack. Uh, in terms of that issue about expanding our global impact um, and the network, what is the Scottish Government doing to support COVID recovery and to work with partner countries to support them in terms of addressing um, monopoly protection, production and protections? Only 5 per cent of Malawians have been vaccinated and they don't have access to testing. We have just been at a meeting with Global Justice now and that was the key issue. What can we do with our partner countries through our global network to help Come. tackle COVID? I think the good news for Sarah uh, Boyack, I hope she knows this, uh, is that this is a major priority for uh, the Scottish Government. This is something uh, that uh, Neil Gray and I myself uh, have been uh, underscoring. In, in fact, it was a point that I was making uh, during the, uh, the Commonwealth Day uh, members' debate uh, this week uh, in terms of our partner countries, in terms of the support that we are wishing uh, to offer and the fact that it is a priority for this government. I hope that assures uh, Sarah Boyack that there is much more that we can uh, do as we all emerge from uh, beneath the cloud uh, of the COVID experience. That is why we have established relations with a number uh, of countries and we wish to do everything that we can uh, to pursue the priorities which she has highlighted. Question number four, Emma Roddick. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on how its international offices are functioning and improving international relations. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland's international network works to create domestic opportunities, attract investment, and ultimately to benefit the people of Scotland. Our offices are focused on improving Scotland's international profile, helping businesses to trade internationally, while protecting Scotland's interests in the European Union and beyond. Together, this will continue to further Scotland's economic, its cultural and policy visibility in key countries in the months and the years ahead. Emma Roddick. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I am sure he, like me, takes pride in the fact that Scotland has chosen to pursue world-leading human rights and equalities legislation. How will his international offices help the Scottish Government to promote best practice in equalities policy internationally? It is an excellent uh, uh, question. We believe that our actions abroad should be consistent with our focus on equality and inclusion at home. This is why Scotland is developing a feminist approach to foreign policy, which will help us build on our international work to date, such as the Glasgow Women's Leadership Statement on Gender Equality and Climate Change at COP26, and a review of our international development programme incorporating a new equalities funding stream. We will also continue to promote our policies internationally, such as a groundbreaking approach uh, on period poverty. Question number five, Bill Kidd. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the Warm Scots Welcome Scheme for Ukrainian refugees. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. We have worked rapidly with local, public, third and private sector partners to set up our Warm Scots Welcome Programme and Super Sponsor Scheme, linking in to the UK Government's Visa and Homes for Ukraine Scheme. We have established welcome hubs to support displaced Ukrainians arriving in Edinburgh, Glasgow and Cairn Ryan with a place of safety and security. These will provide meals, accommodation and triage people to find out what support people need. We will ensure that everyone is treated with compassion, dignity and respect. We continue to work closely with the UK Government to understand when and how people are arriving in Scotland, and we share the frustration of those looking to provide accommodation in Scotland and the anxiety of those fleeing war at the slow pace at the Home Office uh, to turn applications into visas and are working with UK ministers to encourage their greater pace to see people arrive here as quickly as possible. Bill Kidd. I thank the Minister for that information. Uh, does the Minister agree that the safeguarding of refugees in the UK is a top priority and that policies to eradicate human trafficking, procuring and the sexual exploitation of women and girls is an important aspect of protecting those who are more vulnerable to these types of exploitation, such as lone women and children fleeing conflicts and humanitarian crises? Minister. Yes, it is of course vital that those fleeing the illegal war in Ukraine are protected as they seek to find a place of safety. Any form of human trafficking or exploitation is completely unacceptable. I would encourage anyone uh, with concerns about human trafficking to report them uh, to the Modern Slavery and Exploitation Helpline or Police Scotland. We have translated a range of key information on the Scottish Government website and I would urge people uh, to seeking sanctuary in Scotland uh, and uh, those who are assisting them 
them to follow these guidelines. Police Scotland's uh, National Human Trafficking Unit continues to engage with internal and external partners and enforcement agencies to maintain a high visibility of human trafficking and exploitation risks at point of entry around Scotland. And we have also introduced new regulations this week to ensure we have a safe, speedy and free vetting system in place. This means that people who are opening their homes to displaced people uh, of Ukraine can apply for an expedited disclosure checks at the same level of scrutiny as initial checks carried out for those working with uh, children and vulnerable adults. Question number six, Yvonne Brown. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support Ukrainian refugees will receive after arriving at a welcome hub in Scotland. Minister Neil Gray. Thank you, President Officer. Multi-agency teams will be on hand at our welcome hubs to triage people and assess people's needs and provide support with health care to translation services, clothes and food to temporary accommodation and trauma support. The people who come here from Ukraine have a right to work, access social security and public funds. So we will be ensuring people are aware of and get access to the wide range of services and support that they need. Welcome packs in Ukrainian will provide information on accessing a range of support and translators will be on hand to help and trauma experts on call. Siobhan Brown. I thank the Minister for that response. So I have had many constituents contact me who are looking to host refugees who are fl fleeing Ukraine. Can I ask how the Scottish Government is coordinating with the local authorities to ensure that refugees and the hosts are given proper support? Minister. Thank you, President Officer. And I thank Siobhan Brown uh, for giving me the opportunity to thank uh, the people around Scotland for their incredible generosity, um, uh, who are the people who are wanting to open their homes to people forced to flee Ukraine. Scotland uh, has a wealth of experience and learning from previous refugee schemes, as set out in the New Scots strategy, with a tried and tested approach to integrating refugees into our communities, schools and workplaces. We are therefore working closely with a range of partners to develop clear guidance for local authorities and individual hosts as well as putting in place support for Ukrainians arriving through this route. We're all, we are also encouraging all those who wish to provide support to look at the Ready Scotland website. It has information about local refugee support groups, and I would encourage people to reach out to them to see what more they may be able to do to help. And a brief supplementary from Sharon Dowie, who joins us remotely. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, much has been made of the Super Sponsorship Scheme, but what of the next steps? As of last night, officials at Edinburgh Council said they were still waiting for data on those who have expressed interest in hosting Ukrainians so they could start pairing refugees with homes. Meanwhile, hundreds of Scots are still waiting for an update and are ready to open their doors. Has this data been made available to Council since last night? And how many Ukrainians who have arrived in Scotland have been matched with a home? Minister. Uh, I thank uh, Sharon Dowie for that question. Uh, she will share my frustration in the slow pace at uh, the data being received from the UK government. Uh, at the end of the day, we are still uh, uh, reliant on the UK government's immigration system to work at speed. Uh, to be fair, at the conception of the super sponsor idea from the First Minister one Friday to the following Friday at getting up and running, that was an incredible effort to get uh, the system in place. However, since then, it has been a very, very slow process at getting applications turned into visas and for us to receive uh, the data. So I, I appreciate the, the frustration that she feels. Uh, we feel it too, and we are asking the UK government to move much faster to make sure that both those who are offering their support in terms of accommodation here in Scotland and those fleeing war in Ukraine are getting here as quickly as possible. Question number seven, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what engagement the Constitution Secretary has had with UK Government Ministers regarding post-Brexit funding arrangements, including the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which is due to launch this Friday, 1st of April. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scottish Ministers have always maintained that the replacement European Union funding including, included in the UK Shared Prosperity Fund ought to be devolved to the Scottish Government in line with the principles of devolved government and to ensure that investment supports national economic priorities. In the past month, my colleague Richard Lochhead has met with UK Government Ministers twice to advocate for Scotland. Whilst no confirmed date has been given by the UK Government for the Fund's intended launch next month, 
I am optimistic that future engagement can continue to take place to ensure that the uh, Shared Prosperity Fund aligns with Scotland's policy aims. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. It is obviously disappointing that with the fund due to launch tomorrow, you still await information. But the Finance and Public Administration Committee has been advised in evidence that Shared Prosperity Funds are being top sliced from Barnet Consequentials, unlike the situation pre-Brexit. So, can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if this is indeed the case, and if that is so, that Shared Prosperity Funds directed by Westminster simply reduce those available to this and other devolved administrations? Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> well, this is a key question from uh, Kenneth Gibson. Whilst the UK Government has outlined the overall value of the Shared Prosperity Fund, Scotland's specific allocation is still to be determined and therefore it remains unclear what method will be used to allocate the fund on a national basis. There has been no indication that this will be uh, top slice from Barnet Consequentials. Scottish Government uh, officials have calculated in November 2020 that to replace the European structural funds, including both the ETC and LEADER programmes, would require £183 million uh, of funding per year. Supplementary, Maurice Gold. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the UK Leveling Up Fund are fantastic ways in which the UK Government can invest in Scotland. Therefore, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me how disappointing it is that Dundee City Council failed to submit a Leveling Up Fund bid in the first round? Cabinet Secretary. Um, despite the engagement that I uh, drew attention to a moment ago, there is a strong likelihood that in financial terms the UK Share Prosperity Fund will be insufficient. The value of the fund announced in the UK Spending Review last autumn notes that the fund will only provide £2.6 billion over three years across the whole of the UK, with £560 million of this already ring-fenced for the UK Government's Multiply Adult Numeracy programme. This falls far short of the calculations to maintain the levels of investment seen through the European Union structural funds, of which £162 million per annum would be required to replace the European European regional development and European social funds in Scotland, with an additional £21 million required to continue the work of the leader in European territorial cooperation programmes. And I would welcome the cooperation of members on the Scottish Conservative Party benches to apply pressure on the UK Government to at least match the commitment that was shown to Scotland through the European Union rather than the United Kingdom that does not. Question number eight, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how it will be supporting local authorities to make best use of their cultural attractions and facilities. Minister Neil Gray. In 2021-22, we've provided uh, councils with an overall COVID-19 support package up to £1.5 billion. It's for locally elected representatives to decide how best to use resources to deliver culture services. We are continuing to work with COSLA and others towards recovery and renewal of the culture sector, including at local level. And I recently met with COSLA's community wellbeing spokesperson and look forward to meeting with the culture conveners group uh, soon after the May's elections. Uh, Creative Scotland also uh, support culture at a local level, including through their place partnerships with a range of local authorities across the country. Alexander Stewart. I thank the Minister for that response. Spending per head by local authority on cultural attractions varies greatly across Scotland. Even before the pandemic, Clackmannanshire in my region had one of the lowest spends per head in the country at just £2.01 in 2019-20. Can I therefore ask the Minister what action will be taken to ensure and support the cultural sector in Clackmannanshire to ensure it makes a strong recovery from the pandemic? Minister. I thank Alexander Stewart for that question. We place great value in the cultural recovery that we want to see going forward, both in terms of our facilities, our events, our attractions, our arts. Uh, and creative sector, because we have a, a great understanding of the fact that this isn't just about an economic recovery that is obviously going to be so important, but also of the well-being recovery. Uh, you know, we've all suffered from the fact that we've not been able to attend the facilities, the events, the attractions that we would have wanted to over the last two years that uh, bring us great joy. And so, reopening has the converse effect, and will hopefully help in terms of our well-being. So, we'll continue to work with Clamp Manager Council, uh, which is well-led, and, and many other local authorities to ensure uh, that we. Can can continue uh, to ensure that our culture facilities are well looked after. And a final supplementary from Paul McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, public libraries form a vital social and cultural hub in communities in Scotland, uh, including in my own constituency. 
Can the Minister provide an update on the rollout of the Public Library COVID Relief Fund as libraries continue to play their full part in supporting wellbeing during the pandemic recovery? Minister. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, this week we announced the uh, final tranche of the support through uh, that particular fund. Uh, seven libraries uh, received uh, £200,000, I think it was, um, in this week's uh, announcement, and that brings the total up to uh, £1.25 million in that support fund. Um, we will continue to support public libraries because we understand uh, the clear uh, role that they play within local communities in terms of culture and heritage, but also have a wider role to play as well, uh, and we will be looking to ensure sure that we continue uh, to support our public libraries uh, to continue the good work that they're doing. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions. There'll be a brief pause before we uh, move to the next item of business.